Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, and uh, my name is Matthew Comis. I am the Senior Program Manager at Johns Hopkins University's 21st Century Cities Initiative. Uh, the 21CC um, at, at JHU is the campus hub for research, teaching, and outreach related to urban economic growth and neighborhood quality of life issues in cities. Uh, through rigorous data analysis and policy evaluation, our center focuses on how to align the incentives of the private sector and federal, state, and local governments to unlock the full potential of cities, including Baltimore, the U.S., and cities around the world. Now with that, I'd like to um, introduce our speakers for this evening. Uh, so first off, we're going to go left to right, and this is in the order of, of who will be speaking. Uh, we're going to start with Stephanie DeLuca, who is the James Coleman Professor of Sociology and Social Policy at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. DeLuca's research focuses on the ways in which social context affects outcomes for disadvantaged young people in Baltimore and other cities. Craig Pollack is the inaugural Katie and Ayers Endowed Associate Professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management in the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the School of Nursing. In addition to being a practicing internal medicine physician, Dr. Pollock researches the relationship between social determinants of health and housing policy. Corinne Keat is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Keat specializes in pediatric allergy diseases and conducts clinical epidemiologic and translational research on prevention and treatment of those diseases. Uh, and Janet Abrams is the president and CEO of the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. Ms. Abrams has served in public housing administration for over 20 years, including time at some of the largest city agencies in the nation, including Chicago, Newark, and New York City. Adria Crutchfield is the executive director of the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership. Adria's experience includes public service in federal, state, and local governments, most recently with the New York City Department of Building. So how the agenda is going to work is Stephanie, Craig, and Corin are each going to have 10, around 10 minutes to uh, present some of the research. Then we're going to hand things over to Janet and Adria to talk about uh, a new exciting um, healthy children demonstration program that they have going on. And then we'll open it up to the audience um, for some questions and answers, which I will uh, help on. So with that, uh, I want to hand things over to Professor DeLuca. Wonderful. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight with everybody and see uh, in the registrant list a bunch of uh, familiar friends and partners and uh, some uh, also new names uh, and hopefully an opportunity to get to know some more, uh, some more people through this event. Uh, thank you, Mac, uh, and also to Mac Khan for inviting us uh, for this evening's event and for holding it. Um, I'm excited to get a chance to talk about research I've been working on um, cumulatively for about 20 years, trying to understand um, how we can increase housing and neighborhood opportunities for low-income families and children um, with a, a, a specific focus, not only on understanding families' lives as they are, but also understanding as the local mirror says, not what is and what can be, right? When we intervene um, uh, with research evidence uh, in, in the lives of families and children, then also take what we learn from spending time with families and feed that, that back into our intervention. So field work uh, with parents and uh, children and uh, housing practitioners is a, a central piece of the work I do with my team here at the Poverty and Inequality Research Lab. And there are far too many uh, folks to thank on my team um, on giving the talk but can't take all the credit for it uh, and also want to thank um, the generosity of a number of our funders especially our local funders uh, including uh, the Annie E. Casey Foundation uh, and the ABLE Foundation who helped make some of the work I'm going to share with you tonight possible and I have here some photographs from families who have uh, participated in some of the housing interventions I'll talk about and some of my other studies uh, uh, that focus on families who have do not have housing assistance and would like to have it. And I do this um, to make sure we don't forget in, you know, with the aerial view on research, exactly why we're here uh, and why we do the work. And to emphasize, as I try to do, uh, just how much expertise there is in, um, in families uh, we're trying to help and how important it is to make sure and treat uh, what they have to teach us that way. 
So the big picture here, I always like to motivate work by the kind of why we care question. Um, academics love to talk about their research and don't typically need such a motivation, but I think it's important um, to talk about why we care and also uh, what, what we know. Um, and so, uh, you know, what we're learning now after a couple decades worth of research uh, from a number of social sciences is that the roots of the American dream are quite local. Uh, and they're founded in housing and neighborhoods uh, over and above the contribution of family and individual factors uh, to shape children's life outcomes and family health and well-being. Uh, this is a really key and transformative set of findings that give us a chance to act and understand what's possible. Um, when we say that the, the roots are, are local and uh, that the, these settings are important contexts, especially when we think of housing, a good example is to consider housing affordability. And, uh, you know, some research by our own Sandy Newman here at Hopkins has shown that when compared to similar low-income parents who paid 60% of their income toward rent, those paying only 30% of their income towards rent spent more enrichment time, time on enrichment activities with their children and saw their children perform better on reading and math tests. These are quite large effects. Uh, we know housing quality matters. Um, uh, Corinne will talk about that soon. Um, matters of, of dampness, mold, and vermin aggravate uh, not only parental stress, but children's health. Um, lead paint exposure um, is something we're getting more coverage on as things go, and its impact on children's cognitive development and functioning. Uh, housing stability is key. Um, we know from the increasing literature on eviction um, that unstable housing uh, leads to more uh, paternal stress um, and uh, overcrowding and doubling up. Uh, some recent work by uh, Hope Harvey has shown that an additional year in doubled up housing is associated with a 9% uh, lower odds of graduating from high school. Uh, when it comes to thinking about local in terms of neighborhoods, um, we're, we also know that these matter as well. And in, when thinking about how to gauge those effects, another way to do that is to think about, um, you know, children's outcomes. So for example, we know from some evidence in Chicago from Pat Sharkey, Rob Sampson, and Steve Rodenbush, that growing up in a neighborhood of concentrated disadvantage reduces the verbal cognitive scores of African-American children um, by four points on their measure, which is equivalent uh, to a missing a year of school. So place, place matters. Um, these effects also accrue to a high school dropout. Now we know that local matters, um, but we also know that the situation is dire when it comes to how unequally distributed such housing and neighborhood opportunities are. We have a persistent and increasingly well-publicized housing affordability crisis. We know, um, thanks to the a National Low Income Housing Coalition that in no state, metro, or county in the United States can a full-time year-round um, worker earning minimum wage afford a two-bedroom uh, unit at area uh, um, average median rent um, within a housing wage gauged uh, at about $24 an hour. So we know affordability is a crisis. We also know that there's increasing residential segregation by income and persistent residential segregation by race such that as Pat Sharkey has shown, uh, when you have a, a white household uh, earning uh, $30,000, that household is more likely to be living in a neighborhood um, that's similar to that of an African-American family earning $100,000. Um, so there is you know, quite big gaps in a segregation race, segregation of neighborhoods and, and its, its uh, uh, impacts on housing quality and opportunity access. So we know enough, and we also know enough to act, um, which is not always the case uh, when it comes to trying to make a difference. Um, so how do we do it? How do we provide a housing and neighborhood opportunity? Well, we have one program, one policy already that can do that, so that's good news. It's the Housing Choice Voucher Program. That's at least one tool in our toolkit. Um, it's not the only one, and we can certainly talk in Q&A about others. Um, but it doesn't work nearly as well as it could. Just to give an overview here from the um, Center for Budget Policy Priorities in 49 of the 50 me largest metro areas in the country, the share of uh, voucher-assisted households, families with children living in low-poverty neighborhoods is far lower than it could be when compared to the share of affordable units, okay? So we're missing opportunities here. If we know place matters, there's a, there's a lost potential. And this is to say nothing of how unequal opportunities are even in the voucher program for access to opportunity by race. 
So we have some good news, which is uh, over 20 years worth of evidence about how to improve um, the voucher program and, um, and how to provide services so that families have more residential choice um, when they have the voucher. In theory, the voucher should provide choice. It's not to tied to an individual neighborhood. Um, but as I mentioned, um, we see the majority of families in the United States without housing voucher live in moderate to high poverty neighborhoods, um, which again is a lost opportunity. But we've had a series of housing mobility programs. I won't go into detail on all of them. Um, these are um, programs that I've had the pleasure of studying as far back as the original Chicago Metro program, uh, a lawsuit um, that uh, Alex Polakoff and colleagues brought uh, to this all the way to the Supreme Court. And this takes us all the way to the Creating Moves to Opportunity program in Seattle today, which I'll tell you about. Um, but I'll point out some important findings from the Moving to Opportunity experiment born out of the efforts in the, the control litigation in Chicago and the Baltimore Housing Mobility Program. Um, you'll hear from Adria soon. Um, this is a, a, an opportunity I've also been lucky to have to work here locally to understand what happens when uh, families in the Baltimore area are provided with resources to have more residential choice. The good news about the programs, if we kind of lump all together what we know, is that these interventions have helped thousands of families move to safer, higher opportunity neighborhoods with better schools uh, and have improved family well-being and children's long-term prospects on a number of outcomes. Um, each program has had, of course, different effects that we can talk about more in Q&A. But I want to point out a few from the uh, Moving to Opportunity program, which um, uh, happened here in Baltimore um, uh, in a number of uh, four other cities in the United States and Craig will talk more about that in a minute. Um, but we see that in um, the results from the MTO program, which is given, uh, given gives gave families a chance to move to lower poverty neighborhoods with their housing vouchers, uh, we saw a reduction in obesity and diabetes risk for mothers in the group that got the chance to move to a low poverty neighborhood and uh, strikingly an improvement in mental health among mothers on par with best practices and antidepressant medication therapies, a finding that I think is, is, is quite striking. Um, I have heard, uh, it's hard to express the, the accounts of parents from the MTO program. I interviewed with my team uh, back in 2003 and 2004, uh, as well as the parents in the Baltimore Housing Mobility Program and, uh, and, and in Seattle, just the relief that comes with having safety and um, being able uh, to have the bandwidth to, um, to take care of your children without having to worry about danger in the neighborhood and housing instability. Um, it's their profound accounts um, that we've written about in, in um, some of my papers my team has put out. Uh, we've also seen for children um, that were in the Moving to Opportunity program, those younger than age 13 saw an increase in college attendance and earnings when they were older. So we have evidence that place matters and that and we know how to do some interventions to, to be able to uh, increase residential choice and improve social mobility and well-being. Um, Another uh, a table I want to show you locally from the Baltimore program here, um, just the, the large changes in school characteristics. This is a little bit dated data, as Adrian knows, but um, we uh, had data through 2012 here in Baltimore um, for about 2,500 families uh, and were able to look at test scores for children, uh, which we're, we are working on, and also changes in school characteristics. And here what you see um, is that there's a, a big difference um, prior to, the, to moving with the voucher in the percent African-American in local elementary schools, as well as a reduction in free and reduced lunch um, and the, the increase in the percent of student body of scoring high, proficient or advanced on state tests. So Lots of good news there. And I'll move um, a little more quickly here. Um, given all this evidence uh, and both research evidence and program-based evidence, there's been a groundswell in policy momentum across the United States to increase um, the number of sites that are going to provide services for families in the voucher program to increase opportunities. The first site that wanted to, um, in this new wave of research that wanted to um, bring researchers in was the Seattle King County site um, where we, uh, have recently launched uh, in 2018 uh, an experiment with uh, elements that support the voucher program in a number of different fronts um, based on what we've learned from the Baltimore program here, uh, the Dallas program, and a number of other programs to both provide services that are family facing land and landlord facing uh, and also some financial assistance as well. Happy to talk about this. Um, these are all really important pieces in understanding how to improve the potential of the housing voucher. Um, 
Uh, the CMTO program has had striking results to date. Um, these are uh, findings as of March of, of 2020 this year, that families offered a chance to um, receive assistance and move to higher opportunity neighborhoods in Seattle. Uh, we're almost a 38 percentage points more likely to move to opportunity neighbors than the control group who also received a voucher um, but did not receive the offer for services. And this is compared to an historical mean rate in the Seattle region of about 12% of voucher holders moving to opportunity neighborhoods. I won't get into this in detail because it's, there's a lot to talk about, but we spent time with 162 of these families to understand what worked. And what was really striking to us is just how important it was for families to have the emotional support of the staff to help them navigate residential choice. And it was important for landlords to have support on their end from staff to be able to negotiate using the voucher program um, and working with tenants. Um, so we learned this from the ground up. The good news, Craig will talk some more about this, is there's lots of policy momentum um, for two, uh, two sessions in a row. Uh, Republican spearheaded bipartisan uh, supported legislation is appropriated to the tune of $50 million support for the expansion of housing mobility. Um, we saw bipartisan sp uh, sponsored legislation to increase the number of vouchers um, and also with an eye toward giving customized services for families to move to higher opportunity neighborhoods. This is an exciting bright spot and an exciting time and lots of partners across the country have expressed interest in doing this. So we're seeing ground level enthusiasm, which is important and makes some of this work so exciting for me. Um, so I'm going to uh, stop here and turn it over to Craig, uh, who will pick up in more detail on the MTO study. Thanks so much. Thank you, Professor DeLuca. Um, so now we're going to go over to Professor Pollock, who is sporting an excellent Movember mustache. Oh, and you're muted. There we go. Great. So, uh, Stephanie, thanks so much for setting this up. I love the the phrase that roots of the, the roots of the American dream are local, and I think that that uh, also can really apply to how we think about healthcare and people's uh, health and well-being. And so, what I want to try to do in the next ten minutes is try to expand what you've been saying and build on that uh, in talking about uh, what we know about healthcare use. And I want to also motivate this by saying that. Um, that there's this incredible groundswell about trying to understand housing uh, choice vouchers and housing mobility programs from understanding uh, children's educational, children's college performance. And I think there's a real role for a healthcare system to play here in, uh, in investing in, in this opportunity. And to say that healthcare systems are already investing uh, in the role of housing more generally. There was a study that came out in Health Affairs saying that uh, about $1.6 billion were invested by healthcare systems in the last two years, in 2017 through 2019. So this is a place where there's, uh, there's real interest in trying to understand and impact the social determinants of health. And I think there's been less attention on kind of the role of, of families and the role of uh, how to support children, recognizing that a lot of times their healthcare use is actually lower because they tend to be healthier, which is great, but also thinking about kind of the compounding effects, the benefits that, that uh, can accrue over the life course. So I, I wanna uh, just start by also uh, acknowledging the multiple collaborators on this project um, and the, the funding as well. So. Sorry, we, we had uh, two questions that we were trying to answer that I'll, I'll go through really briefly here today. So the first was trying to understand what is the impact of moving to opportunity on long-term hospitalizations and emergency department visits. So uh, really trying to understand kind of big picture, what, what's the impact? And then trying to drill down a little bit uh, in more detail, thinking about conditions that are housing and neighborhood sensitive, including conditions like asthma that uh, Corinne is gonna talk about in, in just a moment. So as uh, Stephanie mentioned, moving to opportunity experiment has really been a touchstone in the social science and, and health uh, literature uh, because of its randomized control design. So in, in the mid 1990s, about 4,500 families were randomized into three different arms. There was a control arm, uh, as well as two different voucher arms, a low poverty voucher arm and a traditional voucher arm. Uh, these were all families living in high poverty neighborhoods um, and uh, in public housing. 
And there were five different cities that were part of this study. And as Stephanie went over, and I'll not spend very much time on, but there have been a number of really important findings that has helped make the case as to why neighborhoods matter, why uh, the American dream and health are really local, including the work by Raj Chetty and colleagues looking at, at uh, earnings among children, uh, physical health uh, among adults, and some, uh, some children's health measures. And so what we wanted to do here was link this moving to opportunity uh, experiment to different types of healthcare data to try to understand what is the long-term impact on healthcare use. And here we have two uh, basic types of data that we linked to. One was uh, hospital all-payer data. Every time that uh, you or I get admitted to the hospital, it gets reported uh, to the state, and we got that information from a number of states. And the other is Medicaid uh, uh, claims data on people that were uh, enrolled in Medicaid. And basically, uh, these are the five different sites, um, Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, New York, and Baltimore, and showing the years of data. And what this translates into uh, in our study was up to 21 years after uh, families were randomized into one of the study arms. So really long-term follow-up on, on these children in ways that it hadn't been possible before. And it's, it ends up being uh, quite a lot of data. So 56,000 person years of data on adults. Every time an adult is in the sample for a year, that's a person year of data. And over 120,000 person years of data in children. The sample that we were able to match, it was about 4,000 adults and 9,000 children. And at the time that these uh, adults were randomized, they were in their, their uh, low 30s on average. Um, children were eight uh, when the time they were randomized on average, and again, followed up to the time that they were uh, young adults. This is an, an really important in terms of moving to opportunity. So what this shows is what happens to the neighborhood poverty over time in the different groups. And you can see here the, uh, the control group is the squares, the low poverty groups are the circles. And this was an experiment that was really trying to get people to move to low poverty neighborhoods with less than 10% poverty. And what you see here is that many people in this uh, were not able to successfully lease up, were not able to use their voucher. And so the, the differences between the voucher groups in terms of the experiences of poverty for these families was uh, really not all that different. I can talk more about kind of why the control group also uh, declined, but we'll, uh, we'll kind of skip over that in the interest of time. And so when we looked at this, we kind of combined the voucher groups, which gave us a little bit more power to see what might be, be going on. And here you have the main results for the adults comparing the, those, in the, um, those in the voucher groups versus those in the control groups, looking at the rates of hospitalization over the 21-year the follow-up, showing that there's really uh, absolutely nothing going on, that the rates of uh, hospitalizations were the same, the rates of hospital spending were also the same. There was no differences in the rates of emergency department visits either. But when we turn to kids, here's where we see the lines starting to, uh, to diverge, so they're not overlapping. Uh, the, the darker circle is the control group of children. The, uh, the, the lighter circles are the voucher groups of children, showing that the rates of hospitalization among children in the voucher groups tended to be consistently lower. On average, it was about 15% relative uh, risk reduction in the rate of hospitalization over time. We then separated this out in the same way that, uh, that Raj Shetty and, and colleagues did, looking at the, the older versus the younger kids. The older kids are those top lines, showing that, again, that there's this kind of overlapping pattern, that there wasn't a significant effect among the, the children that were older when their families received a voucher. However, when we're looking at the bottom lines, the younger kids, here we're seeing a really significant effect and what we think is a really meaningful effect. So the rate of hospitalizations for the younger children in the voucher group was about 5.3 per 100 person years versus 6.6. .6. This is a meaningful difference. When we take it out and say, it, kind of, let's try to center in on among the people who moved in the low poverty uh, group. What this equates to is about $500 less in yearly hospital spending uh, compared to the, the control group. So this is, uh, we think, meaningful. And you think about this in yearly spending uh, so that these, uh, these benefits accrue over a significant period of time. So we're not seeing a lot of significant associations, again, for adults. Some, uh, some things that we're seeing in terms of some secondary analyses, we're also not seeing any differences in the rates of emergency departments for either kids uh, or adults in the setting. I want to now turn to say, again, I think people for a long time recognized that the impact of moving to opportunity uh, was maybe not as good as it could have been because uh, moving to opportunity wasn't able to get uh, all of the families interested in moving to actually move and stay living in a non-poor neighborhood. And so uh, Stephanie mentioned the appropriations language around the mobility demonstration voucher program with $50 million that's been appropriated, including $10 million for uh, new voucher assistance 
as well as about 40 million to help those with existing vouchers uh, move to non-poor neighborhoods. And there's $3 million that were also allocated for the research, uh, which has been uh, awarded to APT Associates. The really exciting thing about this is that this is going to be a randomized control trial as well, where there's going to be three different arms that have been, uh, been uh, proposed as part of the Federal Register Notice, including uh, comprehensive mobility-related services, very similar to uh, what Stephanie described in the Seattle experiment, as well as a more selected mobility related services. Can you do this uh, in a way that's a little bit more streamlined, that's maybe more cost effective as well as a control group? And I think this, uh, you know, to the extent that it's, it's able to help families move to uh, really uh, non-poor neighborhoods and remain living there for a longer period of time, really we'll be able to better get at what is the potential health effect? How can we understand how healthcare systems might really be able to intersect with these families uh, and potentially make a business case either for the expansion of, of, of vouchers in their own right or having healthcare systems help to invest in some of, in some of these uh, services that, that, that are so important for families and their children. So uh, with that, I'm just gonna summarize by saying that, that there was a lower risk of hospitalizations and hospital spendings among children, especially young children, especially in asthma and mental health, and that the new mobility demonstration offers an important opportunity here to try to get at what is, uh, what is the continued impact on uh, children's health and healthcare. So I'll pass the baton to, to Dr. Keat now, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really uh, happy to be giving, uh, to be talking with uh, such a great panel. And can you see my screen now? Uh, looks good. All right, so I'm gonna talk about a project where we're really drilling down in one disease process, which is uh, asthma. We call it the Mobility Asthma Project. And this is, um, uh, the other co-PIs are Craig, who is on the call here, and Elizabeth Matsu, who's, who's now in, in Austin. We have a number of co-investigators, and I, uh, we are funded in this project by the National Institutes of Environmental Health Science, um, and it's a partnership with a Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership as well, uh, where, and we are, appreciate all the policy advisors, many of whom are on this call. So why asthma, you know, in terms of a disease that we really wanted to drill down more on mobility? Uh, asthma is one of the most important uh, diseases of childhood, one of the uh, largest causes of uh, hospitalization and emergency room visits. It's uh, one of the, uh, the highest contributors to school absenteeism, and it's um, much more prevalent in poor urban areas with rates up to a quarter of children in these areas um, having asthma. And the environment is thought to play an important role as I will um, discuss. So there are a number of environmental factors that, are, that contribute to asthma that are known uh, things that make asthma worse. And some, um, some of those are pest allergens where uh, children are allergic, this, this, all of this applies to adults too, but I'm a pediatrician, so I'm talking about children. <laughs> but so I'll continue to talk about that. But children who have asthma and are allergic to cockroaches and mice in particular, um, have worsened asthma with those exposures. In addition, there are other things about homes that can cause um, asthma to be worse, including uh, indoor air pollution, um, that, is related to smoking or other uh, causes of indoor air pollution. As Stephanie mentioned before, uh, dampness and mold is another thing. And um, there have been a number of studies that have tried to intervene on these pest allergens that we think are such a major contributor to, to asthma in poor urban environments. But we've found that even when, with our best efforts with professional uh, mitigation of pests, it's quite difficult to eradicate, especially mice uh, in Baltimore. And we think that's because it's difficult it, to, to do that in a, a single home without treating sort of the whole uh, neighborhood because mice don't stay in one house. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, these efforts to mitigate pest uh, infestation have not been successful, despite the fact that we know that mouse allergen is a major cause of asthma morbidity among uh, Baltimore children. And when it's when it is possible to reduce mouse allergen, asthma symptoms improve. So we have partnered with uh, the 
uh, BRHP, which, who has the mobility vouchers that have been described by the previous panelists, to uh, follow children with asthma who are in these program, this program to look at their asthma and environmental exposures before moving and after moving. And so this is a map from BRHP and hopefully it comes across okay. Um, it shows uh, where people are moving from, which is the gray areas, the non-opportunity areas, to the green opportunity areas. And I think uh, judging from where we've seen people move, they, it is beyond the, the square of where people can move, but, uh, but often it's um, in that area. And we collect environmental and biological samples, both in the pre-house, as long as it, they are there, um, and then in the house after they move. A number of next steps, you know, we need to analyze uh, all of the data which we're continuing to collect. Are, we are going to look to control groups. Unfortunately, it's not a randomized controlled study. We do have uh, internal controls and then we also have a lot of studies that we have done um, on this a similar population in Baltimore City with various interventions or observational studies that we're going to use to try to understand um, how these patterns differ than, than children who have stayed in the same housing. Um, and uh, Stephanie spoke beautifully about stress and depression and um, our preliminary, I haven't showed it here just in the um, interest of time, but our preliminary studies do show uh, really marked reduction in stress with moving both uh, along a number of domains. And we think that although this has really been focused on pests and that was some of our impetus for starting this, we know that there are many contributors to asthma besides um, just uh, allergy. And so we're interested in how changes in stress are ch may change the physiology of asthma as well and the overall health of children. So we really appreciate this opportunity to partner with the housing groups to try to understand and really how these interventions uh, affect health um, for the children. So thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. Look forward to questions with everybody else. Thank you, Corin. Uh, so we're gonna go over to Adria and Janet. And I know Janet was having some issues uh, with her connection. So um, try to get her back on. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much um, for inviting us to be a part of tonight's discussion. Um, I'm gonna give a quick overview of the Kresge Health Equity Planning Grant that um, was recently awarded to um, the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership in conjunction with the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. So this planning grant focused on an opportunity um, to advance health equity through housing and community driven solutions. That was the specific focus area of the grant. And most importantly, um, the, the opportunity seeks to recognize multi-sector partnerships. Um, uh, oh, I'm so sorry, jumped ahead, I'm trying to minimize you all on my screen, there we go. Uh, that um, seeks to recognize multi-sector partnerships to preserve and increase the supply of stable housing and improve health, well-being, and health equity in low-income communities. So our specific uh, proposal is called the Healthy Children Voucher Demonstration. And again, it's a joint application between BRHP. We are a nonprofit um, organization. We administer the Baltimore Housing Mobility Program, um, and we are doing that in conjunction with the Housing Authority. Uh, it's a one-year opportunity that we received um, $100,000 to plan efforts towards this demonstration. Uh, and again, we were formally awarded December of 2019, one of 20 recipients nationwide. So specifically, the proposal's goal is to create a foundation for aligning housing choice vouchers, which you've heard a lot about tonight. Um, so those help to make affordable housing available to low-income families with health-promoting environments in Baltimore. Uh, in the short term, we hope to establish partnerships and processes showing the feasibility of a health-focused voucher program, and we're aiming to assist and counsel uh, 100 families to start. Longer term, um, we are hoping to see um, health improvements, so reduced ER visits, increase in wellness visits to primary care physicians, 
perhaps a boost in medical uh, service savings, support family's choice, again, to move to um, healthier environments, and to provide sustainable mode for scaling um, to, to other families. Um, and again, hope that you know, our success might then be embraced by other um, housing providers across the country. So more specifically, the scope of the grant includes five main areas, um, refining the criteria for eligibility and a referral process that would enable local health care providers, um, namely the health department, for example, the housing authority, uh, and BRHP to prioritize high-risk families and share information. Um, secondly, convening community stakeholders to shape program mechanics and partner linkages for successful tenancy and access to health resources. In terms of um, our planning efforts thus far, we've um, done a great job of convening a really good group of stakeholders that include um, the health department, our partners at Johns Hopkins um, Hospital, mm -hmm. as well as uh, HCAM uh, and Green and Healthy Homes initiatives. So those are just a couple of our partners um, who've been at the table and, and I would hope that down the road we, we might be able to expand that. Thirdly, um, we're tailoring the existing counseling curriculum that um, BRHP um, uses currently to assist families, but this time to focus on obtaining and maintaining a healthy home to minimize environmental triggers for health conditions and avoid common home health hazards. Fourthly, developing a health, um, health specific materials for landlord outreach. So again, vouchers are utilized in the private market. Uh, and, and so part of our outreach um, is not just to families, but, actual, but also to um, uh, property partners or, or those who own the rental housing stock. And then fifth, um, designing an evaluation to track health-related metrics. And um, that has slightly been amended um, as we have uh, made progress in our planning efforts to um, evaluate the referral process between healthcare providers and housing providers. In terms of the project timeline, so again, we kicked this off, um, well, we received the award 2019, end of 2019, and kicked it off in January, um, have made a lot of continued progress um, despite COVID throughout the year um, with our stakeholder groups. Um, and we are hopeful to be able to launch the, the program um, sometime in 2021. Uh, that definitely will require additional funding supports. Uh, and so we'll be shifting focus to um, seek implementation dollars in the very near future. So that concludes um, the high level overview. And uh, I believe Jan and I are happy to take any questions uh, on that before we then kick it back to the main presenters. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to go through uh, some of the questions as they came in and the order they came in. So uh, I think the first question is um, to Professor DeLuca. Um, question here is, can you describe the significance of percentage of African-American children in years prior and post um, BHMP? Uh, yeah, so this is, as uh, Adria was just talking about the program um, that she and her group run, and what we were looking at um, for uh, some of the earlier period data is differences in neighborhoods and school uh, characteristics for uh, families with children who moved through the program. Um, and what we what we saw is that baseline, um, uh, you know, that there was, uh, you know, nearly 90% African American residents in the census tracts that families came from and some market reductions in that in the tracks that they moved, or I'm sorry, to the schools that they were attending, um, uh, in addition to the tracks they moved to after uh, moving with the program. So that's, uh, hopefully that's helpful. There's always more to say, but um, hopefully that answers the question. Great, thanks. A non-trivial thing I should add, it's very difficult to move the needle on school quality to this degree through actual school choice programs, um, uh, but uh, I think that's a testament to the, to the program um, and uh, how successful it's been to move the needle, not just on neighborhood and housing uh, quality, but also school quality. Thank you. Um, so there's another question here, and this is for all panelists, um, and I'm actually going to add on to a little bit. Um, so uh, Harry asked, these are very big cities. Is there any reason we should expect slightly different patterns and patterns or results in mid-sized cities? And particularly when we're looking at some of the health effects, um, you know, I just, 
I was listening to Corin's uh, presentation and, and wondering, um, you know, looking at different cities and, and the types of housing stock they have, um, would that have any uh, effect as well? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. I think there are different environmental contributors in different urban areas. You know, if mice is particularly are um, particularly a problem in Baltimore, be given the kind of row housing um, housing stock, whereas in New York, cockroaches, you know, with a more vertical housing, cockroaches are more of a problem. Um, you know, these are le different problems in the West Coast cities. So in terms of small cities, I'm not sure how much it's a big city versus a small city as much as it is the kind of environmental situations. I would expect too that there's other other factors besides the pests that are contributing that as we talked about um, things like the stress you know related to exposure to violence and things like that 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 could certainly vary from city to city. I, I can't speak to the sort of mobility issues in smaller cities but I do think there's probably different health effects um, in different areas. Great thank you. Uh, so the next question here, sorry, Craig, did you have anything to add? No, I would just uh, agree with that. And I think that it's so important to replicate some of the work that's being done in Baltimore in other cities to try to understand kind of what are, what are we learning? What can be, uh, you know, what are the lessons of BRHP's mobility counseling that can be learned in other cities uh, and, you know, kind of uh, taken up in other cities? And similarly, what are, what are the health effects that are kind of accompanying those uh, different lessons? Um, how do they relate in Baltimore to other cities is, is, is a key next step. And I, I think other things that we haven't talked really about today, but you know, exposure to envi outdoor environmental exposures, which are always you know, gonna be more concentrated in poor neighborhoods, sort of no matter where you are in the country, those tend to be concentrated in poor neighborhoods. So I think that's another thing that's, that's, that varies regionally, but is consistent that there's of course more concentration in, where there's more poor people. Thank you. Uh, so next question here from Sarah. Um, so she's asking um, about investing in neighborhoods versus housing mobility programs. So it's clear that MTO is impactful for the participants and especially their children who take part. Um, she's wondering about the impacts on the resilience of communities from which people move. I'll, I'll take a stab, but then, you know, happy to let others jump in. Um, I think a few things, um, and there's sort of the, the two slides I cut off at the end. I think that it's important always to say, and I'm, I'm going to guess my, my, my fellow panelists agree, that there's, a, you know, the, the way I, I tend to think about it is how many tools do you have in the toolkit, um, right? So it's not a sort of mobility or place-based approach. Um, it's just we have a, a housing voucher program on the books right now, and we know that there are some ways that we could improve uh, improve the policy, which is a lot easier than you know creating brand new policy. Um, I but I think though that, um, and I feel strongly about this as someone who's you know been in Baltimore now almost 20 years, um, that we can't abandon uh, our cities and our, our cities' uh, poor neighborhoods because there are untold assets that just they're devalued that way. Um, I think the challenge, um, and, and we've been seeing this in, in a number of our, our in our, our work from the Casey Foundation, um, in, in trying to understand neighborhood revitalization efforts that are more inclusive. Um, it, that's been really that point has been really driven home for us. I think the challenge uh, as a researcher is um, to figure out what the evidence base is on how you do place-based investments. It's much more difficult to evaluate uh, because you you know if people move in and out of places. If you sort of do a place-based um, uh, intervention, it's, it's hard to measure individual level uh, outcomes um, as opposed to sort of brick and mortar changes like housing quality improvements, the likes of which we saw in Sandtown, Winchester, but moving the needle on individual level um, uh, uh, outcomes uh, like child and family well-being are much more difficult to come by. And so the evidence base on this is, is thin to non-existent, although um, uh, George Galster is on uh, in the audience. I think he is. Um, he's the he, one of the few people I know who's done a really great evidence-based work on some place-based efforts to this end. Um, but I think it's a challenge, and so the question isn't to only focus on f moving moving folks around, but I think um, is to do better research and follow in more detail uh, the, the investments that are made in place-based efforts, so that we can understand more about how to do it right. Stephanie. Um, unless anybody else has anything to add, sorry, Adrian. 
Sure. I was just going to add that, you know, some another consideration is what is available in the toolbox for families um, immediately because we know the urge or the urgency is, is high for families um, who are living in um, high poverty areas and who desperately seek uh, the same outcomes for their children um, that any other family um, would. So um, it's, it's, I absolutely agree with Stephanie's remarks about it's, an, it's both and approach to solving issues of poverty. Um, but we also do know that um, place-based investments take a longer period of time and, and that change can happen over time and absolutely, you know, we should be working towards both efforts. Um, but, but I do think we confront um, the, the urgency and the housing choice voucher is something that can address the need now. Great, thank you. Um, See so yeah, a hand raised from Barbara Samuels, who I know is a, a, an expert, a local expert in this work. So I'm going to allow her to talk. Um, so Barbara, if you still have a question. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I pushed, raised my hand by accident. Okay. Well, hello and thanks for joining us tonight. <laughs> um, so our next question uh, is from George. Um, and uh, he's asking, how will Opportunity Neighborhoods be operationalized in the new mobility assistance demonstration legislation, and will it be consistent across sites? Craig, you want to take this one? Sure. I think that's a uh, really great and important question. I think the Federal Regist uh, Register notice that I'm going to come back to kind of talks about the idea that uh, the, the housing authorities that are currently applying for this and those that, that end up getting selected will need to uh, come together with the research partner to uh, come to uh, a kind of an understanding and an agreement. Right now, I believe the, the, the level that the Federal Register notice puts out is less than, uh, at least less than 20% uh, poverty. And so uh, kind of will be further discussion around that. I think there my understanding of the notice is that there is kind of a, a sense that this will be a, across the sites, uh, which I think can be great from a research perspective in trying to kind of um, kind of make uh, make comparison across different sites, but also recognizing that that uh, creates difficulty because there is so much local knowledge about kind of what what's important in in a site beyond just kind of the the, the gross uh, statistics on kind of level of poverty, for example. And I think kind of what ultimately gets factored into these calculations is 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 going to be um, something to kind of watch closely. Stephanie is, I know you're part of the research team that's evaluating that and I don't, I don't know if you have other insights. Yeah, no, I just want to say it's, it's a really important question. Um, and, you know, our experience in Seattle and King County suggests is, you know, and this was, uh, uh, this effort used um, the sort of Chetty Teams Opportunity Atlas Index, which was a very different way of measuring um, opportunities uh, in neighborhoods. Um, but that was sort of how it was operationalized in that intervention, but with modification for, as I think Craig nicely put it, sort of this local, uh, you know, uh, uh, knowledge and, and sort of, I always think about it as practice-based wisdom, knowing because you've been serving families, what kinds of things, you know, what it means to have a, bound, a weird neighborhood boundary that doesn't quite fit. And is that street, a, you know, meaningful boundary, which is essential to be able to explain to families who are confused sometimes by seemingly arbitrary boundaries when it comes to doing this in practice, um, as we saw. So there's always a bit, I think, of um, you know, field efficacy and how the intervention is done, which is always going to be there um, and, you know, will certainly help implementation, even if it makes a little bit of it, of the measurement a little bit messy for researchers. Uh, and I see that George has his hand raised, so we're going to allow him to talk. Um, George, if you want to unmute yourself there. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks for your great presentations. I just would be curious as to the panel's thoughts about whether poverty is the most efficacious indicator in terms of delineating neighborhoods that might vary in their health impacts across, across neighborhoods. And, and if poverty isn't the single best indicator of neighborhood effects on health, what do you think might be a better one? Well, I, I, I don't know if, if Craig, or, or Craig want to take this one. Again, it's, diff it's a difficult question, George, is the ones you ask always are. Um, 
But I think, uh, and I'm curious too, what, what Adrian might think about this. I, I mean, I think the, Craig, do you, you want to jump in? I'm going to have thoughts on, um, you know, why we would want to use different measures or what we have to gain by understanding segregation, say, by race, in addition to poverty, right? Because of all the visible, invisible, observed, and observed things that track that sort of, you know, profound structural uh, racial inequality. Um, but when it comes to, to sort of identifying what opportunity looks like, it can be, uh, it can be challenging. Yeah, I, I agree that I think that I think poverty is often used because it's it's convenient and it kind of is is able to in, incorporate encapsulate a, a lot and has data that's that's readily available to to measure it. But I, I agree that it's probably not the the only thing that you'd want to incorporate. I do think there's there's um, kind of always a lot of debate in kind of some of the other research that I do about like do we want to use the area deprivation index? Do we want to use a different measure of poverty or a different measure that gets that kind of racial composition as well? And I think it's you know, telling to me that, that a lot of these measures are often very highly correlated with each other. Uh, so they're often getting at, uh, uh, you know, very similar places uh, and neighborhoods with, with some kind of uh, variation as well. So I think kind of how, it, how to implement this in practice in terms of the new mobility program is something that's going to be uh, really important for the, the kind of evaluators and the public housing authorities to kind of come together on. And I would just, oh, go ahead, Corinne. Oh, no, go ahead. I would just add that, yeah, I, um, while the, uh, the origins of the um, Baltimore Housing Mobility Program did focus highly on um, poverty rates, as was listed in one of the tables, um, we, we do the opportunity, opportunity mapping now with like a series of indicators, so 21 different indicators that we're looking at, poverty being one of them. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's, if you, there are lots of indices out there that do kind of pull together all a, a number of criteria to try to get at, you know, what potentially may yield the best outcomes for particularly children. So. And just that, you know, obviously income is not the only measure of, of poverty in terms of, we know that the wealth gaps are larger than the income gaps in terms of, of sometimes. Great. Um, so we're coming up on 630, but um, try to get through one more uh, question here. Uh, and I'm going to lump two together uh, in, that, in the interest of time. So uh, the first one is to Dr. Keith from Peter uh, saying, were you able to uh, assess exposure to tobacco smoke in your cohort study? And um, uh, Phil Leaf uh, has a question, um, are there lessons from these studies being applied or that should be applied? Uh, to the redevelopment going on in Baltimore, such as that um, it's happening in, in Perkins, Somerset, and Old Town. Um, yes, we collect uh, qu by questionnaire, by air nicotine mo monitoring, and by uh, air pollution monitoring in the house, but we just haven't analyzed all that data. We have seen preliminarily uh, decreases in indoor uh, particulate matter, which correlates with tobacco smoke exposure, but just haven't, there's a freezer full of nicotine monitors. We haven't measured, we haven't processed yet. We're also doing urine samples as well for the trifecta. Right, oh, sorry, yes. So for cotinine, which is a byproduct of tobacco. And then again, uh, highlighting that, that question from Phil Leaf, are there, are there lessons here um, uh, that should be applied for, for redevelopment? Um, uh, in Perkins, Somerset, and Old Town, um, in terms of housing quality or or, um, or anything else. I think from a health perspective for asthma, we're still trying to figure out which elements of you know of uh, the sort of talk you know if, to the extent that it's a more less healthy neighborhood, what elements of it are making it less healthy. Um, but it's it's possible that sort of the whole picture of you know, concentrated poverty. Um, that's my personal opinion, but not necessarily based on our research. Great, thank you. Um, well, we're at 6.30, um, so I know there are a couple more questions that we weren't able to get to, so apologies for that, but um, just wanted to thank all of our panelists for um, being available uh, this evening, and thank you all for attending.